In the late fall of 1990, eager audiences lined up at movie theaters across America to see Child's Play 2, after having waited exactly two years since the feature film debut of killer doll Chucky. This bigger and bolder sequel brought the maniacal doll's escapades to the big screen once again, and in the process skyrocketed him to horror icon territory. The film contains some of the most iconic imagery and one-liners from the franchise, and is considered to be the best of the series by a vast majority of fans. That being said, fans have still yet to receive a notable documentary or retrospective regarding the making of the film, so sit back and relax as I take you in-depth on the behind-the-scenes story and creation of one of the best horror sequels of all time, Child's Play 2. Sorry, Jack. Chucky's back. In 1988, production company United Artists had an unexpected smash hit on their hands with the release of Child's Play, which grossed $44 million worldwide on a budget of just $9 million. Not only that, but they had simultaneously created a budding slasher icon. However, in 1989, Australian company Quintex Entertainment purchased United Artists from MGM UA Communications and opted to only produce prestigious films. Their decision was applauded by the Los Angeles Alliance for Survival, among other child advocacy groups, who claimed the first film's exploitative and violent nature was unhealthy. Paramount Pictures, Warner Brothers, Columbia Pictures, 20th Century Fox, Carol Co., New Line Cinema, Walt Disney Studios, and Universal Pictures all expressed interest in picking up the film rights to the series and a sequel. Ultimately, it was none other than Steven Spielberg himself who wound up assisting producer David Kirshner in convincing Universal Sid Sheinberg to accept the deal. And so, on March 28, 1989, Universal Pictures acquired the rights to the sequel from United Artists, and Child's Play 2 went straight into development. The pivotal job of director was given to the late, great John LaFia, co-writer for the screenplay of the original, responsible for coining the name Chucky, and contributing trademark dialogue such as Hi! I'm Chucky. Want to play? And I'll be your friend to the end. Lafia had made his directorial debut with 1989's The Blue Iguana and went on to direct cult classic Man's Best Friend in 1993. Kirshner, who already had a good working relationship with Lafia based on the first film, had seen The Blue Iguana and felt confident in Lafia's ability to direct, thus handing the reins over to him. Kirshner was also responsible for bringing Don Mancini, who created the character of Chucky and wrote the original draft of Child's Play, back into the franchise, unknowingly creating a legacy that would continue to this day as Mancini has written the screenplays for all six sequels while directing three of them, and is currently writing and directing for the new Chucky series coming out later this fall. Unlike the first film, on Child's Play 2 Mancini would receive a sole writing credit, because he felt that the character of Chucky wasn't developed to its fullest potential in the first film, Mancini gave Chucky a true personality and played the events of the movie off of him. He was also able to reuse several of his ideas from his original screenplay for the first film, particularly the classroom and factory sequences. Yet he still remained confined by the voodoo mythology element established by director Tom Holland in the previous entry. Aside from Lafia and Mancini, co-producer Laura Moskowitz, executive producer Robert Latham Brown, Chucky designer Kevin Yeager, and editor Edward Warshika were also carried over from the first film, which enabled the group to pool ideas and develop the characters, story, and Chucky's abilities right from the beginning. Production on Child's Play 2 began on November 6, 1989 at Universal Studios with a budget of $12 million. Most of the interiors were shot on sets constructed in Stage 28, 
also known as the Phantom Stage because it was built for the filming of the 1925 Universal classic, The Phantom of the Opera. Exteriors were filmed in various locations throughout Pasadena, Los Angeles, and Long Beach, California, save for a few shots picked up in Chicago, Illinois for the opening sequence. On December 1st, 1989, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees began picketing the film. The source of their frustration laid in the fact that the producers, Living Doll Productions, were using non-union technicians. The crew voted overwhelmingly to be represented by the IATSC, and the contract took effect on January 8, 1990, with just 11 days remaining out of the film's 55-day shooting schedule. The film picks up two years after the events of the original. Andy Barkley is now a traumatized eight-year-old who has been placed in foster care following the admittance of his mother to a mental institution. Alex Vincent returned to reprise his role of Andy Barkley in Child's Play 2. This time around, he is a little older and speaks less in syllables. His character is much more aware of his situation, making the circumstances all the more tragic, and Vincent plays it well for a kid. Following Child's Play 2, Vincent didn't do much more acting, but he did reprise his role as Andy Barkley in Curse and Cult of Chucky in 2013 and 2017, respectively, and is set to return in the new television series. There are many rumors as to why Katherine Hicks didn't reprise her role as Karen Barkley in the sequel, but the simple fact is that John Lafia wanted to take the story in a new direction, a direction that ultimately did not include her character. Despite this, in his original draft of the sequel screenplay, Don Mancini did include a courtroom scene that involved a jury sentencing Karen Barkley to a mental institution while Chucky lies out on a table as a piece of evidence. This scene was later repurposed for the ending of Curse of Chucky. I'm still alive! Meanwhile in the story, Play Pal's toys company has obtained the charred and decapitated good guy doll from the crime scene. Mr. Sullivan, the slimy CEO played by television actor Peter Haskell, has demanded the reconstruction of the doll in order to dispute any negative publicity surrounding the company. The opening scene of Child's Play 2 is one of the many highlights of the film. In a satisfying montage, the audience gets to watch Chucky transform from a pile of charred rubber into a shiny new toy, ready for display. The whole sequence was very thought out and storyboarded in advance. Lafia and Jaeger had many thorough discussions regarding the look of the doll's underskull and the tools that would be used to clean it. More specifically, Lafia wanted to include the scraping of the teeth and requested that the head be on a turntable so that it could spin at the camera. Don Mancini also said that with this script, he was able to bring in more of a focus on the company itself and the machinations of the marketing in the factory, something he had more of in his original script for the first film. In the process of being rebuilt, Chucky is resurrected a la Frankenstein, and with the ensuing death of one of the technicians that built him, Chucky is back. <laughs> Elsewhere, Andy is taken in by a couple consisting of a disgruntled man and a subdued woman by the names of Phil and Joanne Simpson. The two decide, against Phil's better judgment, to take Andy into their home as a foster child, but not before he is reacquainted with Chucky in a harrowing near crash. English actress Jenny Agutter would earn the role of foster mother Joanne Simpson. She is a mostly sympathetic character because there seems to be a little bit more subtext to her. It's been in my family for three generations. My uh, grandmother gave it to my mother, and my mother gave it to me. And who are you going to give it to? Why don't you take us upstairs and explore? I'll be up there in a minute. Joanne tries her best to take care of Andy, but is ultimately unsuccessful. Agatha is an award-winning actress who has starred in classics such as Walkabout and cult films like American Werewolf in London, and continues working to this day, most notably in BBC's popular television show, Call the Midwife. Garrett Graham plays the role of foster father Phil Simpson. His portrayal of Phil is very stern, and for a majority of the film, he comes off as an unempathetic bastard. All right, Andy, come on. Now, this is going to stop. I will not allow this foolishness in my house. Do you understand? Open the door. Oh, Phil. Joanne, please. That being said, Phil's refusal to believe Andy presents a necessary and formidable challenge to our protagonist. Graham is well known for his comedic roles in cult classics such as Phantom of the Paradise and Used Cars, and seems to be mostly retired these days. 
Once they arrive, the Simpsons welcome Andy into their large and colorful, albeit severely antiquated, home. Bill immediately lays down the first of many ground rules after Andy innocently caresses one of Joanne's family heirlooms. Lafia said he wanted the look of the Simpsons' home to be a little off-kilter. The interiors of the home were strikingly designed by Ivo Cristante, complete with high ceilings, skewed angles, extra tall doorways, and super long halls. The colors are garish, bright as the blue of Chucky's overalls or the red of his hair, intentionally but subtly suggesting a child's Caligari-esque nightmare. Most of the interior sets were constructed six feet off the ground. This extra elevation allowed the filmmakers maximum visual freedom by keeping Kevin Yeager and his Chucky crew below, offset. Although sets typically have open space above to allow for lighting and sound equipment, Lafia specifically requested that the audience be able to see the ceiling in the frame to provide a sense of realism, inspired by famed director Orson Welles, who was the first to do so. Lafia also felt that Child's Play 2 should primarily be shot from a child's perspective, and more specifically from Andy and Chucky's perspectives. To achieve this effect, Lafia employs very wide lenses, very low angles, bright colors, and a deep depth of field, as he felt this was how the world looked to him as a child. The results are marvelous, as the childlike look of the film is one of its most effective qualities. On his way upstairs, Andy is distracted by the sound of music coming from one of the bedrooms. He incidentally intrudes on a young woman smoking a cigarette, who turns out to be his new foster sister, Kyle. Christina Lee landed the role of spunky and street smart Kyle in her feature film debut. Elise's performance as Andy's foster sister is always a standout in the film. My fosters that would shoot you for staring at them cross-eyed. Really? Sure. They figure you're not theirs, you're just passing through. And the minute you screw up, <clears throat> they let you have it. The feisty and rebellious edge that she brings to the character complements young Andy Barkley well and brings an interesting dynamic to their relationship. Elise would go on to star in the third adaptation of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, simply titled Body Snatchers, among other films, and also snagged the recurring role of Emily Valentine in the popular 90s television show 90210. In 2017, Elise reprised her role as Kyle in a post credits scene in Cult of Chucky and is set to return alongside Alex Vincent in the new television series. While exploring his new bedroom, a good guy doll comes crashing down on Andy from inside the closet, sending him running scared. Joanne apologizes for the ignorance on her and Phil's part, and the two leave Andy alone to calm down. Later that night, Play Pal's toys employee Matson, played by Ally McBeal star Greg Gurman, takes the newly rebuilt Chucky with him at the behest of his boss. Uh, what do you want me to do with the doll? Stick it up your ass. While Matson stops in a liquor store, Chucky tracks down Andy with the help of Matson's car phone and some seriously neglectful behavior from Andy's social worker, Grace Poole. Dynamic actress Grace Zabriskie was cast in the role of social worker Grace Poole. While her role is a relatively small one, Zabriskie does what she can to make her presence feel warm when she's on screen. You okay, honey? Mm-hmm. Don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> At the time of filming, Zabriskie was fresh off working on David Lynch's Wild at Heart, and already well known for her role as Laura Palmer's mother in the groundbreaking TV show, Twin Peaks. John Lafia said that he specifically wanted to cast cult actors to play the supporting roles in the film, and Zabriskie, as well as Jenny Agutter and Garrett Graham, all fit into the cult patina he wanted covering the film. After Matson returns to his car, Chucky holds him hostage at gunpoint, and once they've reached Chucky's targeted destination, Matson is quickly dispatched in a breathtaking manner. <laughs> As previously mentioned, Kevin Yeager and his team were tasked with bringing the diabolical doll to life once again. This time around, Jaeger also had the opportunity to serve as second unit director. Months of preparation went into creating the new Chucky for Child's Play 2, and it definitely shows as Chucky looks his absolute best in this film. The animatronics and puppeteers are all at the top of their game and have significantly improved since the first film. In order to make Chucky's speech more realistic, anytime he spoke, his face was filmed at 18 frames a second instead of the usual 24 then sped up in post to match the rest of the footage. This technique gave Jaeger and his crew a little more time to sync up their facial movements to the words and tackle tough letters such as F and B. The production primarily used three separate dolls, a full-body standing Chucky, controlled by cables, 
required nine puppeteers with joysticks working in perfect synchronicity from various off-screen hiding places or beneath the floor. The cables ran through one foot, which was grounded, while the other foot was mobile. A second servo motor doll was operated by remote control, and a third hero doll was used only for shots above the waist. Jaeger and his crew mastered the look and operation of Chucky in this film, and subsequent films have never quite matched the efforts of this one. Of course, the animatronics would be much less effective without the incredible voice of Brad Dourif to back them. Luckily, Dourif returned to voice Chucky again for the sequel. Although he is primarily a screen actor, Dourif's vocal capabilities are extremely impressive and are integral to the character of Chucky. Unlike the first film, all of Dourif's dialogue was recorded prior to principal photography to ensure the perfect lip synchronization of the doll on set. With more for Chucky to say and do this time around, Dourif is undoubtedly having a great time playing the character. This is the film that really introduced Chucky's dark sense of humor, as it contains many of his classic one-liners. Not only that, but this film marks the first time we really get a good listen to Chucky's signature cackle that would go on to become a trademark of the character. <laughs> After killing Matson, Chucky infiltrates the Simpson home and soon finds a competitor in Tommy, the good guy doll from Andy's closet. Chucky swiftly destroys his doppelganger with Joanne's precious family heirloom and subsequently buries him in the backyard. The next morning, Andy and Kyle are both punished for the destruction of the priceless sculpture, immediately putting Andy on bad terms with just about everyone in his foster family. After overhearing Phil telling Joanne that he's unhappy with the situation, Andy decides to pretend that he is comfortable with the Tommy doll in order to change their minds. Later that night, Andy's plan backfires when Chucky ties him to his bed and reveals himself. Chucky begins his first attempt in the film at the ritual, but he is quickly interrupted by Kyle, who inexplicably enters the room through the window. After Andy shouts and knocks Chucky down, the Simpsons rush into his bedroom, finding Kyle standing over a restrained Andy. They blame her for the whole incident, while Andy claims it was Chucky. At this proclamation, Phil angrily snags the doll and throws it down the basement steps. When Chucky's nose begins to bleed, it's revealed to him that he is turning human and running out of time. The next morning, Andy is sent off to his first day at school. Unbeknownst to him, Chucky isn't far behind. In fact, he's right underneath him. Soon enough, Andy finds himself in a world of trouble after his teacher, Miss Kettlewell, played by renowned character actress Beth Grant, forces him to stay after school for detention as a result of Chucky defacing Andy's paper with vulgarity. After Miss Kettlewell leaves to call the Simpsons, Andy escapes through the window, leaving his teacher directly in Chucky's path. While searching for Andy in the closet, Chucky lunges out and stabs her with a ball pump, then proceeds to beat her to death with a yardstick. <laughs> Because Lafia was so persistent about making sure they got the perfect takes of Chucky, it took an entire day to shoot the sequence of Chucky coming out of the closet with the ruler. Clearly, it was well worth the time, because the shots of Chucky in this scene are some of the creepiest images of the entire franchise. Andy returns home and tries to tell the Simpsons it was Chucky, but Phil, of course, refuses to believe him, showing Andy that Tommy is right where he left him at the bottom of the steps. The incident at school leads to a quarrel between Phil and Joanne about whether they should send Andy back or not. Andy, isolated and defeated, overhears the entire argument, and after sharing a poignant moment with Kyle, he decides to take matters into his own hands. Arming himself with an electric carving knife, Andy heads down into the basement to finish off Chucky once and for all. After several false alarms, Chucky ambushes Andy from above and pins him down. The commotion alerts Phil upstairs, and by the time he reaches the top of the basement steps, Andy is standing at the bottom alone with the electric knife, looking quite insane. Phil proceeds cautiously down the steps to disarm Andy, and in the process is tripped by Chucky with a fishing gaff. Chucky delivers an unforgettable line and unhooks Phil's foot, dropping him to his death. How's it hanging, Phil? Uh, uh, uh. Phil's death was achieved with a classic film trick called the reverse pull. Essentially, actor Garrett Graham would begin the shot already in his death position, then be pulled upwards out of frame by a rope tied around him. The footage was then played backwards, creating the uncanny illusion of his neck breaking. 
A distraught Joanne immediately blames Andy for Phil's death and promptly sends him back to the foster center. Wanting to rid herself of the entire situation, Kyle throws Chucky in the trash. As she smokes a cigarette on the backyard swing, Kyle discovers the buried and demolished Tommy doll, confirming her worst fears. Kyle heads inside to investigate after hearing a loud commotion upstairs from Joanne's bedroom. In a fraught moment of suspense accompanied by fantastic sound design, Kyle makes her way up the stairs and enters the bedroom where, in an homage to Psycho, she discovers Joanne's dead body. Joanne! Kyle stumbles backwards onto the bed where Chucky rises from behind and ambushes her. A chaotic fight ensues and Chucky takes Kyle hostage at knife point, forcing her to drive him to Andy at the foster center. Once the two arrive, Chucky pulls the fire alarm to clear the building. On his way out, Andy finds Kyle standing at the bottom of the steps with Chucky at her side. Grace Poole approaches from behind and is disgusted that Kyle would pull such a prank. Grace pulls the two of them into her office where she rips the good guy doll from Kyle's arms. In a flash, Chucky comes to life and stabs Grace repeatedly. Amazing, isn't it? In the midst of the chaos, Kyle and Andy are separated, and Chucky forces Andy to jump in the back of a newspaper van in order to escape. Kyle heatedly pursues the van in a car chase until they arrive at their final destination, the place where it all began, the Play Pals Toys Factory. The factory's exterior was actually a sanitation plant located in Long Beach, California, and eagle-eyed viewers may also notice it was used as the steel mill in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. The interior of the factory was completely constructed inside of a warehouse near Valencia, California. In his script, Don Mancini had described in detail most of the large set pieces within the factory, giving the crew a good idea of what the machinery should look like. John Lafia had the idea of making the factory very bright and colorful, likening it to something out of Willy Wonka, as opposed to being dark and gloomy, which he felt wasn't unique. And despite the logistics of the assembly line being somewhat absurd under close scrutiny, the entire factory sequence is extremely effective in its execution. Once inside the factory, Chucky knocks Andy unconscious and begins another attempt at the ritual. Chucky does manage to make it through the entire chant this time, but when his nose begins to bleed again, he realizes that it's too late and that he is permanently trapped in the doll's body. Suddenly, Chucky is crushed by a falling pallet of good guy dolls with Kyle on the other end. Enraged, Chucky chases after Andy and Kyle, intent on killing them both. The two run through a seemingly endless labyrinth of good guy dolls in a direct homage to The Shining until they finally reach the exit. As Chucky chases the two up a conveyor belt, Kyle pins his hand with a gate. Completely trapped, Chucky is forced to tear his hand off at the wrist and promptly replaces it with a makeshift blade. Chucky then kills a factory technician and in turn creates one of the best shots of the entire film. <laughs> After he catches up to Kyle and Andy, the two force Chucky into a large machine where he is mutilated by arms and legs that are forced into his torso. Chucky manages to escape the machine by cutting himself off from the waist down and riding out on a cart. He then makes a final attempt to stab Andy, but gets his knife stuck in a radiator, pinning him in the perfect spot for Andy to cover the evil doll in molten plastic. Andy rushes to save Kyle who had been knocked out by the dead technician's swinging body. The two are observing Andy's handiwork when a half-melted Chucky leaps to life for one final attack. Kyle shoves a high-pressure air hose into Chucky's mouth, which blows his head to smithereens, in an homage to Brian De Palma's The Fury. Andy and Kyle exit the factory at the dawn of a new day, unsure of where to go, but confident that Chucky is dead, and even more confident that they have each other. A relatively uplifting ending, a rarity for horror films. But this was not always the case. Originally, the film cut back into the factory where it is revealed that Chucky's eye has landed in the vat of molten plastic following the explosion. 
The hunk of flesh is sucked down into the depths of plastic where it is carried through the pipes to a molding mechanism. In a burst of steam, the mechanism opens, revealing a bald, eyeless head and a mouth that breaks into a familiar, devilish grin. This ending was cut for unknown reasons. Perhaps the studio wasn't sure about making a third film yet. Or maybe John LaFia wanted to end the film on a positive note. Or perhaps it's the crew member that you can see in the bottom of the frame. Regardless, it seems this alternate ending served as inspiration for the eventual opening of Child's Play 3. Composer Graham Ravel was recruited to replace Joe Renzetti, who had created a sinister electronic sound for Chucky in the first film. Prior to Child's Play 2, Ravel only had one credit to his name, Australian psychological thriller Dead Calm. Ravel actually secured the job by bluffing to Universal Studios about having composed a complete orchestral composition before, and it's a wonderful thing that he did. Ravel is quoted as saying, The score is quite unusual, especially for what is essentially a slasher movie. It is bigger and more melodic than most of the genre because I wanted to help situate the action within the family to play the context and the mythic nature of the doll. Ravel's carnivalesque score complements the themes of childhood throughout the film and creates a playful yet deadly atmosphere. Ravel is also responsible for creating an unofficial theme for Chucky with his recurring motif in Child's Play 2. This motif can also be heard in his score for Bride of Chucky. For many years, the soundtrack remained unreleased, existing only in spotty edits that sounded like halfway decent attempts to remove the vocals and sound effects from the master track. This was the case until an official soundtrack was released by La La Land Records as a part of the Universal Pictures Film Music Classics Collection in 2020. The CD includes every track in the film in their original forms, as well as extensive liner notes. Some bits of the score were cut out of the final release of the film, but every note written and performed is included on this album. The marketing campaign for Child's Play 2 employed many tricks to get the word out. The first being a wildly successful teaser trailer that didn't even include any footage from the film. Sorry, Jack. Chucky's back. Child's Play 2. It's playtime. Again. This ad campaign ended up being nominated for a Hollywood Reporter Key Art Award. The marketing for the film also included a promotional 900 telephone number, which allowed fans to hear the voice of Chucky. The number received 40,000 calls in just one month. Chucky also made a surprise appearance at the Horror Hall of Fame to promote the film, donning a white tuxedo no less. But when it comes to spending your hard-earned money on a real movie, remember, buy American. Go see Child's Play 2. Let's sit, England, get my limo, I'm out of here. On top of this, a tie-in novel by author Matthew J. Costello was commissioned. The novel generally follows the same structure as the film, with some notable exceptions. In the novel, Chucky's background is a bit more fleshed out. It is revealed that he was bullied as a child for his mother being a dwarf, and to top it off, she was also very abusive towards him. Eventually, Chucky snapped and strangled his mother to death, giving his nickname of the Lakeshore Strangler a whole new meaning. Despite this, none of these storylines have ever shown up in any of the films, although that may be subject to change, as it looks like we will be getting flashbacks to a young Charles Lee Ray in the new television series. In 1988, he was destroyed and left for dead. Now... Sorry, Jack. Chucky's back. Child's Play 2. Rated R. Now playing at theaters everywhere. Child's Play 2 opened on 1,996 screens across America on November 9, 1990, exactly two years after its predecessor, which premiered on the same day in 1988. The film debuted at number one on the North American box office charts and raked in $10.7 million during its opening weekend. It continued to earn money through its 56 days on the big screen, although at decreasing rates, and reached a total of $28.5 million domestically by the end of its theatrical run. The film's worldwide gross amounted to $35.8 million. 
Audience goers seemed to love the film and were happy to have the newly established horror icon back in theaters. More Chuck for the buck. Critical reception of the film was mixed, with famed film critics Siskel and Ebert denouncing the film for its unnecessary depictions of children in jeopardy, yet acknowledging the effectiveness of the factory setting in the finale. On the other hand, Betsy Sherman of the Boston Globe called the film more fun than the original, thrilling, you'll laugh and scream. Despite grossing nearly $10 million less than its predecessor, production on the next sequel, Child's Play 3, began almost immediately. And so, just a short nine months later, Chucky was back in theaters. And the movie bombed. Horribly. But that's a story for another video. Briggs and up now, Child's Play 2. Uh, here's the drive-in totals. Eight dead bodies, no breasts, two dead dolls, two motor vehicle chases, bicycle pumped through the chest, head bashing, electrocution, mechanical eye gouging, throat slitting, cellophane head bagging, exploding head, heads roll, plate glass window foo, yardstick foo, hot bloody wax foo, three and a half stars. Check it out and Rusty and Summer and I are going to continue with our Nairwitch Project. Here. Child's Play 2 has an interesting history when it comes to its television broadcasts. For many years throughout the 90s and early 2000s, the film was aired on cable in an extended format that included many deleted and extended scenes, as well as the notorious alternate ending. Most of the scenes were presumably cut for pacing reasons and reinserted to pad the runtime, as was common practice in the 80s and 90s. But some of these scenes really helped flesh out characterization specifically for Phil and Joanne. In the theatrical cut of the film, both of the Simpsons seem very cold towards Andy with no real underlying motivation for their apparent upsetness. In the television cut, it is revealed that the two are struggling to permanently adopt a child and are repeatedly rejected even though Joanne has quit her job so she can stay home with her foster children. It paints the characters in a new light as we witness a despondent mother in Joanne and a compassionate husband in Phil something virtually unseen in these characters in the theatrical cut. These days, all networks have reverted to using the standard theatrical cut for broadcasts. Despite the popularity of these deleted scenes online, none of them have ever been included in an official release, save for the new German media book from Bierenblatt, which simply pulls them from one of my YouTube uploads. But these scenes must be in Universal's backlogs somewhere, and hopefully someday they will be included in HD on a Blu-ray or 4K disc. But until then, we are stuck with VHS recordings of old cable airings. Horror films have been a tradition in Hollywood since the beginning. Do you think the Child's Play films will live on and be appreciated for years to come? Yes, I do. They'll be considered true classics like Frankenstein, Dracula. There will be Chucky retrospectives. I will always be loved. In the 31 years since its initial release, Child's Play 2 has gone on to become the gold standard for horror movie sequels and the best film in the franchise. Writer Don Mancini crafted a wickedly fun screenplay, and while it isn't without a few plot contrivances, it's undeniably entertaining. The film moves at a relentless pace, and this time around the audience gets to enjoy Chucky's antics at full throttle for a majority of the film's runtime. A welcome change from the slow burn mystery style of the original. The entire cast gives strong and convincing performances, and the relationship that develops between Andy and Kyle as two foster siblings is really quite touching. That kind of heart hasn't shown up much in the series since this film. The unhinged climax also stands as the best to date because of its eye-popping scenery and impeccable score by Graham Revell. For many fans, myself included, the film is an important part of our childhood that has stuck with us throughout our lives. I believe this is directly because of John LaFia's influence on the film. LaFia took his specific perception on how childhood looks and feels and created a visually stunning and inverted fairy tale. It resonated with us as children then, and it continues to resonate with us to this day. And for that, we have John LaFia to thank.